again, 2 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to pick up with verse 6 and make our, uh, make our way to verse 30. Father, this is your word. We ask that you would bless the reading, the teaching, and the studying of it. We ask that you would share with us the great things, uh, the great principles and lessons of your word today, Lord. We love you. We love your word, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story is told of two congregations that were located only a few blocks from each other in, um, in, a, in, a, in a very small community. The two congregations, these two churches, were struggling to keep their doors open. They had already began having meetings about closing the church down, and they just couldn't stay open and all. And, and so the church leaders from both churches thought it would be a good idea to meet and just talk about the idea of merging the two churches under one united, larger, more effective body, rather than just having two struggling churches only a few blocks from one another. And so everyone thought it was a great idea, but there was just one problem that needed to be settled. Just one. The problem was this. They could not agree on how to recite the Lord's Prayer. Um, you see, one group preferred to say, forgive us our trespasses, where the other group wanted to say, forgive us our debts. And neither group wanted to give in. Neither group wanted to change what they were going to say. And after an intense meeting, a long drug out meeting, they decided not to merge and both churches just went their separate ways and continued to struggle. Well, the newspaper found out about it, and uh, the newspaper wrote up an, argo, an, 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 an article on the entire ordeal, and this was the line that headlined the article. It said, one church went back to its trespasses while the other church returned to its debts. <laughs> you know, as funny as that story is, the sad reality is that it doesn't take much to make Christians divide and fight with one another, does it? Um, I'm sure sitting in this room, there are people with scars to prove that very principle. Um, division and fighting are, uh, are definitely prevalent around, among churches and Christians today. And it's sad, you know, I was telling the first service, I got a lot of pastor friends and I talk to church leaders all the time. And the stories that I hear about the vision and fighting within the church, it's just, it's absolutely, it saddens my heart to see how much is going on in the world that we're living in today. You would think that with everything going on in the world, you would think that the church would be united, at least the church. At least Christians wouldn't fight among one another. But the reality is that there is a lot of division, there's a lot of well, my friends, the passage before us today is just that. It's one of fighting and division. And it's among God's people, His chosen people, among Israel. And you should prepare yourself because this is a sad and sobering chapter. I was telling some people before the service, I wouldn't pick this chapter if I was any other preacher at a denomination where I got to pick the topics or whatever I was going to teach. I wouldn't pick this chapter. I wouldn't do it. But it is a sad and sobering chapter in the history of Israel. But being that we teach chapter by chapter, I'm going to take it on and see what the Lord has to say to us today. But you're going to see in this chapter, there's division and there's fighting. And just when you think it's over, there's more division and there's more fighting. It seems like it never ends. And here's what I would like to ask from you today. I, 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 I want to ask that as we make our way through the chapter, that you would be open to hearing from the Spirit of God. Because just maybe God has divinely seen to it that we would study this chapter today and maybe there is some fighting and division and some aspect of your life and God is wanting you to get it right today. And so we'll come to verse 6 where we're going to begin our study. Verse 6 says, Now it was so while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David that Abner was strengthened in his hold on the house of Saul. Now, chapter 3 is really a continuation of what we've already read and learned in chapter 2. A couple of things you need to keep in mind as we come into this chapter. First of all, you have the Philistines. The Philistines are the neighboring country to the west of Israel. 
and you would say that the Philistines are Israel's greatest enemies, right? The Philistines have just launched a massive military campaign against northern Israel, and the result was quite devastating. In just one battle, we're told that Israel's army suffered a tremendous loss and defeat. We're told that the Philistines have now invaded the land and occupied a large portion of northern Israel. And we're told that the royal family, the first king of Israel, King Saul and his sons have been killed in the battle. I think we would all agree this is a national disaster for Israel. If for no other reason than the fact that the royal family has been killed in battle, at this point in Israel's history, they have no king. Well, it's also, to, uh, it's also important to remember that way back in 1 Samuel, we, got, we studied that book as well, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the prophet Samuel comes on the scene and he anoints David to be the next king of Israel, to be King Saul's successor, right? And so after King Saul's death, David is seeking the Lord on what to do. The Lord tells David, he says, look, go to Hebron and, and, and there you're going to be anointed as, as king over southern Israel. And so really, you know, keep in mind at this point, David, you know, he's just doing what he knows to do best. He, he says, Lord, you know, what am I supposed to do? King Saul is dead. Israel has no king. I, I know that the prophet Samuel has anointed me as the next king. What am I supposed to do, Lord? He, uh, he's inquiring of the Lord. The Lord says, go to Hebron. And when you get to Hebron, Hebron's in the southern part of Israel. He says, when you get to Hebron, the leaders down there are going to anoint you as king over southern Israel. And so that's what David does. And he goes and they anoint him as king. So as southern Israel's new king, David has a great task before him, does he not? The task before David was to gently extend his kingship into the northern territory, to northern Israel, and to bring uh, peaceful allegiance uh, over the entire nation from the south to the north. And so that's David's task. Now get this, you know, King Saul has died in battle. And even though King Saul has died, King Saul's general Abner uh, doesn't, think that David is the right guy f to fill the throne. He doesn't think David is God's choice to be the next king over Israel. So what does Abner do? Abner comes on the scene, and again, we see all this in the previous chapters. Abner comes on the scene, and he takes Saul's only surviving son. His name is Ishbosheth. And he takes Ishbosheth, and he sets him up as king over northern Israel. And so here it is, right now, as we're entering into chapter 3, you have Ishbosheth, the king over northern Israel, Saul's surviving son, and you have David, king over southern Israel. Two kings over one nation. Surely you would agree this is a recipe for disaster, it's a recipe for division, and it's a recipe for war. Verse 6 tells us, Now it was so, while there was war between the house of Saul, that's the north, and the house of David, that's the south. Now, this, just, this isn't just any war, right? I mean, this isn't foreign war. This is the most distressing, the most devastating, and the most demoralizing kind of war. This, my friends, is civil war. Civil war, war between citizens of the same nation. Uh, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's a sad scene for the nation of Israel. They're already a war-torn nation, the Philistines have come in and defeated them, occupied a lot of their land, and uh, uh, killed the royal family. And they're, again, they're already a war-torn nation, and now they're fighting among themselves. You, you, you know, you have, uh, you, uh, you have the people divided between two kings. A civil war breaks out among them. And to make matters worse, notice also verse 6 tells us Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. Now make sure you understand what this is saying. Abner was making a political power play here. Now, when we come to verses 7 through 11, things continue to get interesting. i got to be careful with my words here. Someone spoke to me at the end of the first service, so I need to be careful what I say here. But look at verses 7 through 11. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, so Ishbosheth said to Abner, 
Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers, and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David. And you charged me today with, with, a, with a fault concerning this woman? <laughs> May God do so to Abner and more also, if you do not uh, uh, do for David as the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Bathsheba. Dan would be in the north, Bathsheba is the south. Whenever you see in the scriptures, Dan and Bathsheba speaking of the entire nation of Israel, north to the south. And in verse 11, and he could hear, or excuse me, and he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. Now, did you catch what happened here? It's very interesting. There's a bit of conflict taking place in the northern part of Israel between Ishbosheth, the new king, and Abner, the commander of his army. Ishbosheth accuses Abner of taking one of his father's concubines and um, just having um, relations with her. You got to be careful what I say here. He says, Abner, why have you gone into my father's concubine? Now, Abner neither confirms nor denies the accusation, right? Make sure you understand, if it's true, if Abner had really taken one of King Saul's concubines and had relations with her, then that's a very serious offense. I'm going to tell you why. You see, in ancient times, the deceased king's wives and concubines, they would now belong to his successor. In this case, all of Saul's wives, all of Saul's concubines now belong to Ishbosheth. And the fact of the matter is that Abner could go in and just lay with one of King Saul's concubines, have relations with her. It tells us a whole lot about who this guy is. He has a whole lot of power, a whole lot of influence that he should not have. All he's supposed to be is the commander over the army. He's not supposed to have a whole lot of power and influence over decisions and, and stuff like that. He's he needs to know his role, and he needs to know what he's supposed to do. My friends, what has been true but unstated in our study so far is that Abner is the one in control over northern Israel, not Ishbosheth. He's the one with all the power. Ishbosheth is just a puppet king in his hands. Abner has been playing his political agenda the entire time. His strength, his influence has all been growing. And now Ishbosheth calls him out on his actions and he asks him for an explanation. And what is Abner's response? Verse 8 tells us Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth. Why is he so angry? Why, why, why are you so angry, Abner? I mean, because I'll tell you why Abner's angry. All Ishbosheth is to him is a puppet king. And Abner's thinking, how dare he, he question my decisions? I mean, listen, in Abner's mind, Ishbosheth needs to be filling his role. He just needs to do what he's supposed to, uh, what, what he's told to do. Uh, um, um, and so, instead of answering the question and the accusation against him, Abner now takes the opportunity to remind Ishbosheth that he was the one who set up him as king. The whole reason that there's a northern Israel, the whole reason that Ishbosheth is the king over northern Israel, is because I, Abner, uh, you know, made you that. And so, verse 11, and he, Ishbosheth, notice this, verse 11, Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. Ishbosheth remains quiet now, right? It's interesting. He knows enough about Abner to be afraid of this man. He knows that Abner is a very dangerous man. And he knows that Abner has complete control. Ev anything that Abner wants to do, he's going to do it. And Ishbosheth cannot say one word about it. He can do whatever he wants to do. Now, at this very moment, follow me on this. Abner is the one in control. Abner is the one who has all the influence. At this very moment, Abner could have easily done something and got away with it. He could have easily removed Ishbosheth from his position as king over northern Israel and set himself up as king over northern Israel. 
And you sort of read this and you're like, well, if he's got so much power and influence, why don't he just do it, right? Why don't he just do it? Take out Ishbosheth and make yourself king. Well, there's a problem. And the problem is you got to go back to verse 1 of chapter 3. Look at that. The problem is, verse 1 of chapter 3, watch this. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, a civil war. Watch this. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. That's another way of saying the southern kingdom was growing stronger and stronger. The northern kingdom was growing weaker and weaker. Abner realizes very quickly that the northern kingdom, northern Israel, is growing weaker and weaker, and he understands David in the southern kingdom is growing stronger and stronger. He knows, I would be a fool to set myself up as king over a weak region. I would be a fool to do that. In Abner's mind, he's thinking, if I want to be successful, i got to make a political power play right now. I've got to go over to the winning side. So what does he do? Look at verses 9 and 10. Abner says to Ishbosheth, May God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him. Watch this, verse 10. To transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. So here it is. Abner decides to transfer his allegiance over to David and over to the southern kingdom of Israel, surely for his own personal agenda and surely for his own security. So, true to his words, when we come to verse 12, Abner is going to initiate contact with David for the purpose of joining him. Now, we're going to read a long section here just to cover some ground, but I'll make some comments. We'll come back and make some comments. Look at it here in verses 12 through 21. Abner initiates contact with David for the purpose of joining him. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David, saying... Whose is the land? Saying also, make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. And David said, good. (laughs) I like that. And David said, good. And I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you bring Michael, uh, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So David sent messengers to Ishbosheth. Saul's son saying, give me my wife, Michael, whom I betrothed to, to, uh, who, uh, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of Philistines. And this process sent and took her from her husband, from Paul Tiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Baharim, weeping behind her. So, so Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. Now Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying, In time past, you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, my, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of their enemies. And Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. Then Abner also went to speak in the hearing of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel in the house of, of Benjamin. So Abner and 20 men went with him, came to David at Hebron, and David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And then Abner said to David, I will rise and go and gather all Israel to my Lord, the king, that they may make a covenant with you and that they may reign over all your heart's desires. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. This is good. So during the early part of their negotiations, they're working out some kind of a deal. And it would have been extremely dangerous because there's civil war in the land for David or Abner to travel. And so they depended on messengers to go back and forth with different phrases of the agreement. Verse 12 clearly tells us that Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David. And so they have messengers going back. And ultimately what you see here in verses 12 through 21 is a good example of ancient shuttle diplomacy. And um, as you can imagine, this would take some time and it would take some patience because you would say something through a messenger and that messenger would have to travel all the way down to southern Israel. Then they would have to bring a message back to northern Israel. It takes a lot of time and it takes some patience, right? And so make sure you understand David had no reason not to cooperate with Abner. 
even though everyone knows that Abner is just making a, a political power play here, everyone knows it, but David has no reason not to cooperate with him. As a matter of fact, if David chooses not to cooperate with Abner, what is going to, what's the result? Well, it's going to be more bloodshed, more civil war, more division, more fight, and more disunity. But if David chooses to cooperate, then there's an opportunity to unite the nation under uh, the rule of one king, and that king would be David. So, so here's David. He's like, man, this is a good idea. You know, let's, I, I know that Abner's making a political power play. We'll deal with Abner later, right? But this is a good deal. I can unite the nation under my kingship. And so he makes a covenant with Abner, but only on one condition. Did you catch the condition? It's there in verse 13. David says, but one thing I require of you, <clears throat> you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Why did Saul, or excuse me, why did David make Saul's daughter, Michael, a condition of the negotiation? Because it's simple. Michael was David's first wife, and they loved one another deeply. As a matter of fact, um, David killed a hundred Philistines at Saul's request just to have her hand in marriage. Um, and, and, and then what does King Saul do? Well, you, you remember studying through 1 Samuel? King Saul takes away Michael from David, gives her to another man. This, name, this, this man's name is Paul Tiel. And, 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 and here's David. He just simply wants the woman back that was wrongfully taken from him. He loves this woman, and, and he makes it a condition of the negotiation. He says, Abner, I'm going to make a deal with you, but there's one thing that you need to know. You're not going to see my face unless you bring my wife back to me, Michael. Now, some commentators and Bible teachers, they'll tell you that this was a political move on David's part to claim Michael. I don't know why they say this, but I'm bringing this up just in case you've heard it before. Uh, some, some teachers will say that David needed all of Israel to see him with the daughter of the former king as a way of gently extending his kingship into uh, the land of Israel. I, 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 can, I can understand the point behind it. I can understand why someone would think this, but I, I don't buy into it because I don't think David ever tried to to force his way or manipulate his way to the throne. Everything we read about David and his kingship or coming to kingship, uh, David understood that God had chosen him and that God had anointed him and that God would set him up and deal with all of the obstacles along the way. And so David never forced his way to the throne. He just let God deal with things. And so why, so why did David make Saul's daughter Michael a condition of negotiation? I don't look too far into it. I don't even look for you know, anything spiritual about it at all. I don't see much application here. Maybe you want to pull, pull something out and that's fine. I, I really don't think it's a political power move at all. I think it's as simple as this. David just wanted the woman back that he loved so much and that was wrongfully taken from him. So did you catch this? This is good right here. When Michael was taken from this guy, Paul Tiel, and they're now en route to David. Look at what happens in verse 16. Then her husband went along with her to Baharim, weeping behind her. So Abner said to him, go, return. And he returned. Now we read this, and if you don't know much about what's taking place before, it's sort of a sad scene. I mean, it really is. It's somewhat of a sad scene. No doubt, I mean, no doubt Paul T.O. loved this woman. I have to believe that. I mean, they've done life together. They've probably had some kids together and all this stuff. They've done life together for several years. And now Abner and his men just walk into their home. They take Michael from them and they say, we're going to go. We're going to see David. Now, look, I know it's sad. And you can disagree with me. It's totally fine. But I don't have a lot of compassion on this guy. I don't. I, I, I say it's sad, yeah, but I don't have any compassion on him. And I'll tell you why. At the end of the day, he married another man's wife, and he wasn't forced to do it. He wasn't forced to do it. Surely he knew that this day would, would, would come. 
The only thing Paul to yell could hope for is that David would die. And so you, you got to believe every day of David's life, he probably thought of his, his, uh, his first wife, Michael, how much he loved her and all these things, right? Man, one day I'm going to get her back. One day I'm going to get her back. And I also believe that every day Paul Thiel probably thought, man, I wonder if David's going to come around today, you know, and all this. And so, so here it is. Paul Thiel had no problem receiving David's wife and putting David through all kinds of heartache. Oh, but when the same thing happens to him, oh, he weeps and he gets distressed. You can disagree with me, but I just say this, go home, Paul Thiel. So Abner, so Abner comes to David. He brings Michael back to him. They have, a, <clears throat> they have a feast to celebrate the fact that an agreement has been made between the two men. And so efforts are now in progress to unite the nation. Look at verse 21. Then Abner said to David, I will rise and go. So this is after the feast. He said, I will rise and go, and I'll gather all Israel to my Lord the King, that they may make a covenant with you, and, they may, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. So here's Abner, right? After the feast, he gets up, he promises David, and he's going to return to the northern kingdom or, the, or northern Israel to promote David's kingship. Abner assures David the end result, is going to be just as we agreed. I'm going to go home um, to northern Israel. I'm going to speak with the leaders there. I'm going to tell them about our meeting. I'm going to tell them about our agreement. A couple of days, David, you'll hear from me or one of my messengers. And uh, David, you'll be king over all of Israel. It's as simple as that. So Abner leaves, and Abner is on his way back to northern Israel. Now, look at what happens next. The scene is going to change, and it's about to get real intense. You ready for this? Verse 22. At that moment, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had, uh, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. Now, listen. This is very important. We learned in a previous study that Joab is the nephew of David. And Joab is also the commander of David's army. And listen, he does not like Abner at all. Why doesn't he like Abner? I'll give you two reasons. The first reason he doesn't like Abner, and this is the most obvious reason, is because previously Abner had killed Joab's brother in battle, his brother Asahel. He killed him in battle. And and, 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 uh, and and Joab lived for the day when he could avenge his brother's blood. Every day he woke up, and the one thing that he would think of every day, the one thing that he's passionate about, he's like, I want to kill Abner, and I will have my opportunity one day. I want to avenge my brother's blood. The second reason that Joab doesn't like Abner, and again, this one's obvious, Abner is the commander of the northern army. Joab is the commander of the southern army. They're in the middle of a civil war. They don't like each other. They've been having all these skirmishes and battles and all that. They just don't like each other. They've been fighting against one another. So Joab, he has no idea what's just happened between David and Abner. He's been out making raids. He's been out fighting battles and all that. And, and, and you know how it goes. Here comes Joab. He's coming into the city. And he, someone comes to him and informs him, hey, bro, Abner was just in town. We, we would call this gossip, right? I mean, you can imagine that one person running out. I got to be the first person to tell him, right? Here comes Joab. I got to be the first person. Bro, have you heard? Oh, man, you haven't heard. Let me tell you, man. Let me fill you in. You know, Abner was just here. And, man, Abner was sitting across the table from David. They were having this feast. Bro, they were smiling. They were talking to one another. Man, Abner got up and he said something to David about going back. They fist bumped, man. Looks like they were having a good time, Joab. Looks like they were having a good time. Well, look at what happens now, verses 23 to 25. When Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, 
Abner the son of Ner came to the king and he sent him away and he's gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you? Why is it that you sent him away and he is already gone? Surely you realize that Abner the son of Ner came to deceive you to know you're going out and you're coming in and all that you're doing. So here's Joab. He learns of the day's events between David and Abner and he becomes enraged. He immediately finds David and he tells him exactly how he feels about the matter. He questions his every decision. Now just, just picture the scene, right? There's Joab. He walks up to David. And remember, David is the king. Joab is just the commander of the army. Joab walks up to the king, David, and he says, what have you done? And before David can answer, Joab is on to his next statement. Look, David's having a lot of patience with this guy. I mean, as king, you could, you could take this guy out for speaking to you like that, right? David's having a lot of patience with Joab. Joab refused to believe that Abner was there uh, to, 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 to pledge his allegiance with David and to establish peace between northern and southern Israel. He just refused to believe it. Joab says to David there, this is important for you to remember right here. Joab says to David there in verse 25, Surely you realize that Abner came to deceive you. Remember that. Joab is convinced that Abner came to deceive and spy on David, to learn about all that he's doing. And Joab just can't believe that David has entertained this man and talked to him and has made some kind of, a, 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 of an agreement with him. And Joab's mind, he thinks that what David has done is absolutely foolish. And Joab's mind, if it's up to Joab, Joab would say, look, why don't we just do this? We all know that Abner is the one who has all the power and influence over northern, northern Israel. Let's kill him. Let's kill this guy. And then, David, you can make a claim to the throne of all of Israel. You, we can just go in and we can just take over. That's Joab's mindset. David's mindset is different. David's heart is different. David says, I don't want any more bloodshed. I don't want any more civil war. David says, I desire peace and unity among God's people. And that's what he wants. So Joab storms out of the meeting. David hasn't had a chance to respond. Look at what happens next. Verse 26. Do not read verse 27 yet. Please. You're out of God's will if you read verse 20. I'm telling you. Right? I'm, telling, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Verse 26. And when Joab had gone from God's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well of Syrah. But David did not know it. Now Joab takes matters into his own hands. He sends out a delegation of messengers to ask Abner to come back to Hebron. Now we're specifically told that Abner had reached the well of uh, Syrah, or Syrah, however you say it. Um, that's two and a half miles away from Hebron. So Abner has now made it two and a half miles away. Joab sends messengers out. And he says, hey, come on back. Now, we're not told this in the scripture, but I'll tell you what I believe. And I believe this simply because I do a lot of studying in history and Israel's history and all this. I believe that Joab sent these messengers out in the name of the king. Now, notice verse 26 at the very end, it says David didn't know it. But that still doesn't mean Joab didn't send them out in the name of David. Abner's not going to come back. If Joab sends messengers out and says, hey, Joab wants to talk to you. Abner's not that kind of a fool. Abner's like, I'm not going back to talk to Joab. He will go back to talk to David. You remember what I told you a little while ago? I told you to remember verse 25 because Joab comes to David and he says, surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you. My friends, here's Joab. He accuses Abner of being a deceiver there in verse 25, but then he turns around and he practices deception himself. You see that? Absolutely crazy. Charles Spurgeon once said something very interesting about this. He said, the sins that we most often see and point out in others are oftentimes the ones we're committing and guilty of ourselves. 
So here comes Abner back to Hebron. He thinks that David has something else he wants to say. More than likely, the messenger said, hey, we know you've made it two and a half miles away, but hey, David, David's got one more thing he needs to talk to you about. Come back to Hebron. We'll have another feast or whatever. Then you can go back the next day. Just come back because David has something he needs to talk to you about. So Abner comes back to Hebron. Now read verse 27. Now, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Mm, that's intense. You do realize, you don't need me to say it, this is premeditated. You do realize this is cold-blooded. This is, there's no way that Joab can justify his actions. We're told there in verse 27 and once more in verse 30 that the only reason Joab murders Abner is to avenge the, uh, the, the death of his brother Asahel. Now, just real quickly, I just wanted to share this with you. I wanted to point something out. I think it's interesting. You remember from chapter 2, Asahel's brother, young guy, inexperienced in war. Um, he's pursuing Abner on the battlefield. And Abner is very experienced in war. And Abner yells back at Asahel several times in the midst of his pursuit. He's, they're running. And he tells Asahel, stop chasing me. Stop chasing me. I don't want to kill you. Stop chasing me. Asahel's thinking, I'm the young guy. I'm the young brother. I got to prove something. If I kill the commander of northern Israel's army, Man, I'm going to be something. I'm going to be somebody, right? And so he's chasing Abner down. And when he wouldn't listen to Abner, Abner told him repeatedly, stop chasing me. I don't want to kill you. When he wouldn't stop, Abner turns around. The scripture says he took the blunt end of his spear, the blunt end. And he hit Asahel so hard. Where? Anybody remember? In the stomach. He hit him in the stomach so hard that the spear came out of his back. Told Asahel fell down and died right there. Abner killed Asahel by hitting him in the stomach with a spear. Did you notice how Joab killed Abner? He stabbed him in the stomach. This is vengeful, cold-blooded murder. No way Joab can justify it. My friends, you do realize this vengeful action by Joab is going to complicate David's life significantly. Think about it with me. Abner has all of the power, all of the influence in northern Israel. All he's got to do is go back. It's very simple. All you got to do, Abner, make it back to northern Israel. Uh, you know, go talk with the leaders, the elders of northern Israel. Tell them about the agreement you've made. From there, it's a done deal. David would be king over the entire nation. The two, northern and, 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 and southern Israel, will be now united. But now Abner's killed before he can even make it back to northern, northern Israel. And to make matters worse, he's killed by the commander of David's army, Joab. And he's killed by the man that everyone in Israel knows doesn't like him. It doesn't like him at all. And you know, just like I know, it doesn't take long for word to get out. Word is going to reach northern Israel very quickly that Abner has been killed by the commander of David's army. And what is going to be the response of the leaders in northern Israel? Well, I'll just give you a preview. It's going to be this. They're going to second guess David and they're going to second guess his kingship. David's life has just now been complicated because of the actions of Joab. And then let me run through this real quickly. Verse 28, after word, afterward, when David heard it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Uh, David just publicly announces here that he had nothing to do with it, that he was guiltless before the Lord. Verse 29, David says, Let it rest on the head of Joab and all of his father's house, and let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper, who leans on his staff or falls by the sword, or who lacks bread. Here David curses and places the blame entirely upon Joab and his family. 
And then in verse 30, the author makes it extremely clear that Joab killed Abner to avenge the death of his brother. The author says it twice, um, uh, verse 27 and verse 30. And then the rest of the chapter just goes on to record the funeral of Abner and David's mourning over the death of Abner. I'll let you read that section on your own. As we begin to conclude our time this morning, I want to share something with you. It should break our hearts to read such a chapter like this in Israel's history, a chapter filled with fighting, a chapter filled with division and disunity. Listen, it was never God's plan. It was never God's intention for Israel to be at war with themselves. Now, the law, the Old Testament law, gave Israel permission to defend themselves against foreign enemies, but it never gave Israel permission to fight among themselves, never. And so here they are fighting among themselves. There's division, there's war, there's disunity, and it's never God's plan. And just like it's never, God, it's never God's plan for Israel to be in a place like that, it's never God's plan for a church to be like that either. It's never God's plan for the Christian or for the church to be in a place where there's fighting and division and disunity among its members. Never. Let me just share something with you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul tells us this. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, that you all speak the same thing. And then listen to this. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you are perfectly joined together in the same mind. That's, that's good stuff. And then Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 3, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom is not going to stand. And then Jesus says if a house is divided against itself, that house isn't going to stand. My friends, if we're going to be an effective force in this world as a church, and as a Christian, we need unity in both places. We need unity in our Christian lives. We need unity in our church. And, and, and unity is vital to the health of a church, and it's vital to your Christian walk. I'm going to tell you right now, I've seen it over and over again. When church members are, are, are divided, the church is weak. But when church members are united... The church is strong, and the responsibility of every church member is to be the source of unity. Fighting and division in a church, it only influences people to take sides. What you do when there's division is you're drawing a line right in the middle, and then you're telling people, get on what side that you want to be on. And that's division. That's disunity. And when there's, when there's, when there's that kind of division and disunity in a church, Man, it is just, it brings about a weakness and it, it, it sort of paralyzes the church from doing anything. Um, I want to share something with you. Um, something that's very dear to my heart. You guys know I have, a, I have a big heart for churches and church leaders. And um, you guys know I serve on the board of another Calvary Chapel and uh, a Calvary Chapel that was hurting. And I'm serving on their board to kind of help get some stuff right there. And I talk to pastors all the time. I talk to church leaders all the time. And I, I just, uh, um, I have a text group. You guys probably don't know about this. I have a text group between pastors. And we uh, send it out on Saturdays to a group of pastors. And we talk about what we're teaching on on Sunday. And we talk about how we can pray for each other and all this. And it's just, it's just a good time of just church leaders being together. And um, one thing that we see so often today. One thing that uh, I give you, I give you a little bit of insight into some things that the pastors are talking about. One thing that we see all the time and is so prevalent today is division and disunity among the church. We, we, we look out into the world and we say, man, look at the mess the world has got itself into. If there's one place where there shouldn't be fighting and division and disunity, it should be in the church. Right? We, I mean, we, 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 should, we should be a place where, where there's peace and where there's unity. But I'm telling you, this is a problem all across the world where Christians are just fighting. They just can't get on the same page. And it's so sad. Um, 
There's a guy by the name of Tom Rainer. Tom Rainer has influenced me tremendously over the years. Um, I used to have Tom Rainer on my, on my board up at Calvary Chapel, Elizabeth City, when I was pastor in that church. I had to pay for him to be on my board, but I had him on my board. But uh, in case you don't know who Tom Rainer is, Tom Rainer was the president of Lifeway Resources. He's, he's recently stepped down from that. But Tom Rainer is like a pastor to pastors. He wrote a book called I Am a Church Member. And I would encourage you, it's a short read, it's a quick read, it's not long at all. I would encourage every church member to read this book. It's a powerful book. It has six pledges in it. And as you read through it, as a church member, the book is designed for you to make a pledge saying that you're going to be a good church member in that certain area that he's talking about. I want to read to you pledge number two, being that this is what we're talking about today. Pledge number two, and I want to encourage you to take this pledge. I'm going to take this pledge. I'm asking the staff to take this pledge. I'm asking the church as a whole to take this pledge. Pledge number two in Tom Rainer's book, I Am a Church Member, is um, I will be a unifying church member. I will be a unifying church member. This is what he says. And this is the pledge that I would ask you to say. I'm not forcing it on you, just if you want to do it. But this is the pledge. It says, I will seek to be a source of unity in my church. I know that there are no perfect pastors. There's not? Uh, I'm sorry. I know that there's no perfect pastors. I know that there's no perfect church members. But neither am I. I will not be a source of gossip. I will not be a source of division. One of the greatest contributions I can make is to do all I can in God's power as a church member to help keep the church in unity for the sake of the gospel and for the glory of our Lord. Is that a pledge that we can get behind as a church? I think it is. Listen, I I, I don't know um, if there's any fighting and church unity between certain people in the congregation and all. I didn't teach this passage because I'm looking at all this fighting. I I taught it because we came upon it. That's how we do at Calvary Chapel. We just fall upon these chapters. But I do think that God has divinely uh, orchestrated that we would be here today in this passage. And so I would encourage you, if there's fighting, if there's division among anyone in this church, to get it right. To get it right, man. I mean, don't let another day go by and let all this fighting and division cause weakness upon you and your Christian life and, call, and almost bring you to a place of being paralyzed and all this. I mean, seriously, man, you look at the world and we can't afford it as a church. As a church, we need to be powerful and we need to be a light and we need, we, 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 we need, we need to be strengthened by our Lord. And the Lord is not going to bless a divided church. He will not do it. We have been teaching on Tuesday nights through the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And you go through those letters and you can see what the Lord will bless and what the Lord will not bless. And I'm telling you, he will not bless a Christian who has caused all division among himself and other people. And God will not bless a church that is divided over the most silly issues you can think of as far as, you know, as I can think of and even some major issues as well. So... That's the word of the Lord for us today. It's a tall order. I think you would agree. And I think we should go before the Lord and we should pray about these things. And we should close with that. You guys want Dwayne and Nicole to close us with a song? We don't have to now. I mean, I know you guys, I know how you feel about Dwayne and Nicole. I mean, you know, you guys love them. You guys absolutely love these guys. We love having them lead us in worship. Father, we ask now that you would do a wonderful work. We ask, Lord, and we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we trust, Lord, that you have sought to us that we're in this passage today. And I'm just asking, Lord, that you would look down upon us and that you would not only see any division and fighting that may be among us, but, Lord, that you would help resolve that. 
Lord, would you do a good work? I just pray for the people of this church. I pray that we would take that pledge seriously, that we would be a, a Christian, a church member that does everything we can to keep the unity in our church, to keep the unity among other Christians, all for the glory of you, Lord. So do that work, Lord, and do it by the power of your Spirit. You know if there's division and fighting among anyone in here. And I ask, Lord, that you would bring people to a place of humility and bring people to a place where they say, I'm not going to let another day go by. We're going to bring this thing to a, 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 a resolve. We love you, Lord. We love your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.